Out of control. Out of control. You're confused. But don't worry. Don't worry. Your soul it must get it's gotta get better. It must get better. It's gonna be. Hello, everyone. I am Tara Godan, Director of Montgomery County's Department of Health and Human Services, and it is my honor to welcome you to the fourth week of our Montgomery County Black History Month celebration. In response to this year's National Black History Month theme of the Black family, representation, identity, and diversity, we have focused on the Black family in the context and lens of education, criminal justice, parenting and family, and the faith community. This week, we are focusing on faith. So what exactly is faith? To some, faith is an unquestioning belief in something that can never be proven, a confidence that stems from an inner certainty. This sort of knowingness is bound not only by evidence made manifest by the senses, but by a complete trust in the presence of things unseen and in powers beyond our full understanding. Others say our faith is our religion. Enslaved Africans brought their own religions to America. In time, Blacks adopted the slave master's Christianity, but reinterpreted it to suit their own particular needs. The Black church may have retained Christianity's core ortho orthodoxies, but Black worshipers chose to express them in new, uninhibited ways. Keeping alive the traditions of our ancestors, they shouted and danced, they clapped and waved their hands, they actively participated in the preacher's message through call and response, and they signaled their approval of the preacher's sermon with shouts of, amen, and well, and preach, preacher. And then there was the music itself deeply moving spirituals like, I don't feel no ways tired, precious Lord, take my hand, wade in the water, and oh, happy day. Many people credit religion for helping African Americans through, get through the hard times of slavery, those first years of freedom and the many, many years beyond. After emancipation, the church became the center of life for many African Americans, serving as schoolhouse, theater, political forum, social club, and courthouse. The church was also one of the only places that African Americans could safely gather and congregate without the fear of harassment and persecution from whites who wanted to continue the enslavement and the oppression of Blacks in America. Today, churches, mosques, temples and other religious institutions provide support and structure for a lot of black religious life. But faith is more than religion. In 1966, in response to the Watts, Watts riots in Los Angeles, Dr. Molana Karenge, professor and chairman of Africana Studies in California State University, created Kwanzaa as a way to bring African Americans together as a community and to recommit ourselves to the collective achievement of a better life for our family, our community, and our people. In recognition and acknowledgement that African Americans are diverse in their beliefs, traditions, and cultural expressions, Dr. Karinga based this week-long celebration on various African harvests or first fruit celebrations and festivals. Now, one of the seven guiding principles of Kwanzaa, which we know is celebrated every year between December 26th and January 1st, is Imani, the Swahili word for faith. As the seventh and last principle, faith is defined as a profound and enduring belief in and commitment to all that is of value to us as a family, as a community, as people, and a culture. 
It reminds us to have faith and believe with all our heart in ourselves, our people, our family, our teachers, and our leaders so that we can and we will overcome challenges and be victorious in our fights for justice and for equality. Amani is faith in our people, faith in our struggle, and faith in all that makes us beautiful and strong. It is firmly believing that a better world can be created for all of us now and in the future. So however you define faith, one thing is certain. Faith is powerful. Faith has moved mountains, built empires, defeated invincible armies, and stirred billions of people through the ages. Faith protected us, covered us, comforted us, guided us, and empowered us. From generation to generation, faith has given us the strength to stand fearless in the midst of our enemies and face seemingly insurmountable hardships uncompro and with uncompromising and unwavering confidence and sometimes supernatural courage. Faith enables us to trust for the impossible, believe for the invisible, and expect for the improbable. Time and time again, faith has renewed our minds, restored our hearts, refreshed our spirits, rejuvenated our dreams, and revived our purpose. So faith allows us to stand on the shoulders of our African-American ancestors and remember their words of wisdom, like the words of Mary McLeod Bethune, the daughter of former slaves who became one of the most important black educators, civil rights leaders, and government officials in the 20th century who said, we need faith. Without faith, nothing is possible. With it, nothing is impossible. And of course, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. who taught us that faith is taking the first step even when you can't see the whole staircase, but we must take that step. And today we continue to be moved by the faith and encouragement of our leaders like President Barack Obama who inspired an entire nation with a new faith-filled mantra of yes we can. And even in this very moment in time, unified, we ignite our faith singing songs of victory, like the Negro National Anthem, To Lift Every Voice. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present had brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. And we persevere, continuing to sing songs of our present and future hope. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall overcome someday. We must walk in faith, march in faith, fight in faith, build in faith, live in faith, love and faith and keep in faith. And that is why we are here today. Above all else, celebrating black history in a black family is a celebration of faith. Cele celebrating faith in triumph, celebrating faith in our future and celebrating faith in a new day. So on this fourth and final week of our Black History Month program, I am incredibly honored, excited, and full of hope-filled faith as I joyfully welcome each and every one of you to our celebration. Welcome, welcome, and again, I say welcome. Now I'm gonna turn it over to our awesome moderator for today, Sonia Sanders. Thank you, Tara. As you have displayed every week, you have given the passion and the enthusiasm. You are our hype woman, as they would say, everyone requires a hype man. Well, you are that hype woman. So uh, as Harris mentioned, this is our last week. Uh, our first week consisted of education. Our second week consisted of criminal justice. And our third week consisted of family and planning values. And wrapping it up today, we have faith. So before we begin, I would like to provide a couple of housekeeping rules. 
Our panelists have been notified of their timeframes. And in addition to their timeframes, as we get closer to your time mark, I will request that you keep your chat open. And within 30 seconds, I will point my finger to give you 30 seconds to wrap up your response respectfully. So with further ado, I would like to move to the panelists' bios to introduce who our panelists are today. Prior to that, um, what I'd like to mention is that we start every Black History program with our Lift Every Voice and Sing. Today we have Kirk Franklin's rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing. As a bonus selection, we have an Arstown Area School District student by the name of Brianna Arroyo, whose rendition is list listed and located on our website at www.montpelier.org. by boat in 1912 from Portsmouth to Philadelphia, right to the riverfront on the Delaware River. And uh, as they are getting on during segregated Jim Crow times, the father, my grandfather gets on, he is shuttled to the white uh, cabin. My grandmother and my father and the rest of the children are obviously black, biracial. They get shuttled to the black, um, the black cabin. Just bear with me for another two seconds. I'm a Baptist minister, so it takes me a little while to tell this story. Uh, my grandfather objects to his family being divided, but they've loaded this car on this boat. And so they create a third cabin. They all ride in a car on a boat to the north. They are constructing family. They are doing it against the wave of society. And I think when we see these kinds of stories, we see the power of the religious narrative, we see the power of the family, we so see also the power of people to imagine a different way. And I think that is what the Black church has done with Black families. It has constructed a family where people come from the South in part 
in waves and generations and they build those families. And so it is remarkable because if you go to a black church, you will hear aunt and uncle spewed by people who have absolutely no genetic relationship but are connected by a narrative. And so they build and construct family, which I think is very usable in the American context because while many of us are not biologically related, we're still connected by this remarkable American story that I hope we continue to breathe new life into. And so for me, the black church becomes this yeasty cauldron of reimagination where family is built and constructed. Thank you, Reverend, for your input. Now we would like to ask some input from Bishop Spencer. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, um, I'm just grateful to be a part of this today, but I just wanted to agree because sometimes when you see the word faith, you look you look for a location and the location will be the church. And in, at the church, you wanna see all the components of family, whether it be marriage, whether it be co-parenting, uh, whether it be broken or families that are together. So faith um, brings on some type of structure, some type of uh, ability to um, be accountable to each other for life to be better. So faith um, means a lot in every approach of accountability as we move forward in constructing our marriage, being great parents and, and developing a good family value. Thank you for your input. We will now move on to the second question. And the second question, we will begin with Pastor Marshall. And that question is as follows. How has faith been influenced in how Black people are dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I think, I think you've got to break it down for different groups. I was, uh, we're almost approaching the one year anniversary for when church effectively stopped in person in, in Montgomery County, at least for, for my congregation. And initially my greatest concern was for my seniors. And uh, we're an older church, we're a traditional church. So I would say that um, my first concern was how are people going to take care of groceries? How are people going to make it? And I was most concerned about seniors. I've got one lady in the congregation who's 109 years old. I've got another 101 year old. And I was concerned about how they would be. And so I would call these seniors and I would say, do you need anything? And they would almost quizzically say, no, of course I don't need anything. Because in their mind, they have been through the depression. They have been through World War II. They've been through Korea. They've been through Vietnam. They've been through the civil rights movement. And they abide by the idea of Christianity of be ye also ready. And so they're ready and they can't imagine a household. Now, God, obviously we have extenuating circumstances of of poverty, of food scarcity, but they could not imagine that people would not have enough rice, that they would not have enough cans of beans, they would not have enough chicken thighs frozen in the refrigerator to be materially fine. And so I was concerned about them when I pivoted away from my seniors and started looking at more of uh, Pastor Lockley's generation and my generation. And we would talk to them, these people who've made three and four times more money than their grandparents, take fantastic vacations, uh, drive expensive cars, and they were not okay. And so much of it really was because their generation has invested so much in stuff and the older generation had invested so much in faith. And so I had to really pivot. My older members are fine. None of the older members are saying, when are we going back to church? It is that group that is in their 30s, 40s, and 50s that is very unsettled, that they are more thermometer than they are thermostat. They're more a gauge of what's going on. And so I would say people who are deeply rooted in an abiding faith have been absolutely good and fine in this environment. But people who have more of a transactional faith have struggled to make it more. And I think that's also insightful for us because in our mad dash to be contemporary, and the same thing has happened with the different uh, trajectories of Judaism, is oftentimes you leave the really good, solid foundational stuff and you take it off the table and then you're left with the fluff. And then when you get in a pandemic, the fluff doesn't serve you well. So people who've got a deeply rooted faith, who understand the idea of being ready, being prepared, and being uh, and being still, have done 
phenomenally well. The other more transactional people are struggling, and that's the group that we've got to watch. Thank you, Reverend Marshall, for your input. Uh, Bishop Spencer, would you like to add some value to that question as well? Yes, can everybody hear me now? <laughs> yes. Good, 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 great, great, great. Okay, uh, me, so uh, one of the things um, um, for the Black Church, uh, I was concerned with um, that we get the right information, that we invest in what's going on with COVID-19, making sure that uh, we are poured in properly to give the right information to our ministries, because we can either help the situation or we can destroy people's idea of what's going on. And, you know, because we are preachers and, and people really uh, invest in us, they take us by every word that we speak. It, it was important that for me, myself, that I learn the data because I'm in the pharmaceutical uh, arena. So data is everything. Information is everything. And giving the correct information would do um, our faith-based communities well so that we can push them in the right direction to be an assistant or to push what's going on now. Thank you for your response. Reverend Gar Garrison Lockley, do you have any uh, input? When I look at the COVID-19 pandemic, we're dealing with multiple pandemics. We're dealing with uh, pandemics. We have, a yes, the global health crisis that we're dealing with. We have systemic racism that we have seen um, since 2020. We have seen um, economic crisis. People are furloughed. People have lost their jobs. So when I look at just COVID-19 exposed all that in this country and throughout this world. And, it's, and, and we as um, African-Americans, as the black church, and um, we have been resulted not to be able to go into our church buildings our places of worship. We had to immediately in, in March, um, I know I couldn't go back um, the fourth week of March and we had to reimagine ministry differently. I was, I, it broke my heart while I was unable to go to my, um, to see my, my, uh, seeing my seniors in nursing homes and be able to commune them. And now we're resulted as the as the church resulted on social media platforms and Zoom. And we had to learn all this together when it comes to learning technology. So it has been impacted us as pastors and clergy and our God's people and our communities. But we had to reimagine ministry differently in this present age, as my Bishop Ingram would say. And um, so we, we had to think differently. We had people are depressed. People have been isolated in their homes, can't get out. Can't, um, you know, Reverend Mar um, Mitchell was saying about the food scarcity that was happening. And, and it feels spiritually, it is, has been a huge weight on us as pastors and God's people. And I believe that uh, through it, you know, I always say the gospel according to Andre Crouch, through it all, I have learned to trust in Jesus. I have learned to trust in all and trust in God. We have to, it's important to put our, our faith is in the forefront now. And it's important that I, I'm able to call, we, we're able to call each other. We're able to have Zoom worship, worship. We're still staying connected. And it's very important to stay connected and give someone a call to write a letter, whatever it may be, it's important to stay connected when this COVID-19 has separated us, has divided us. We're not able to do our family gatherings and the weddings and celebrations that what we're used to doing. But this is the new, the new norm or the new now, we will call it. And it's, it's how we deal with it. And we have to deal, we have to, church has to be the church. And we have to come to the forefront and, and be the church to open up our hearts, open up our, our time and our talent and, and to encourage and bring hope to people in our communities. So it's been difficult. It has been a difficult time for me and, and I'm sure for every other pastor and clergy and, and everyone on this, um, on this call, but 
but through it all, we will get it to, we will um, get past this. We, through it all, we will continue to, um, um, it will bring us closer together to God. It has for me. And um, we will have a continue to have a deeper relationship with God through it all, through this, um, in the midst of this pandemic, because it's still, it's not over with yet. Thank you all for your valuable insight. Um, and thank you for being uh, bringing up the different ways of the different me mechanisms that we are facing other than just faith, as you mentioned, depression and mental illness. So I think that's important. Um, key aspect that I got out of that was staying connected, staying connected with others, reaching out to family members, just reaching out to those that we haven't talked to in quite some time. So thank you for that. So we will now move on with our next question. And that question is, how has faith been a source of support, hope or stability within the African American families? So without further ado, I will address that question to Bishop Spencer first. Amen, thank you. I hope I'm not too simple. <laughs> I just try to be as direct <laughs> as I can, amen. Um, but I wanna say, I believe faith is the driving force that keeps the African-American families pushing towards the possibility of access to an opportunity to be successful. In particular, the belief in God and what he expects, as well as the reward that we'll, we will receive for following his command gives people hope. With that being said, faith gives us a roadmap of instructions or moral standards that should be applied in our everyday life, which these instructions and moral standards bring on stability and develop a sense of confidence in families. Faith offers community, meaning a support system that shows you're, you're not alone in this walk. Everyone has an experience or testimony that could be at some point helpful in your journey to be better. And most faith-based organizations, they supply daycare, feeding the community, the hungry, clothing, giveaway, counseling. They strive to meet every need for the struggling, even the thriving families that still needs. Faith offers a God, uh, that God that has no respect of a person, or in other words, he shows no more favoritism to the other. He looks not at who the person is, but he looks at the heart, which encourages, encourages and empower people to know that all have an opportunity for more and greater things in life. So faith just has been the glue that binds the African-American families and the life together, like strings that cannot be broken. That's my response. Thank you, Bishop Spencer. At this time, I'd like to ask uh, Reverend Garrison to add some input to that question as well. Bishop Spencer, you have confirmation about that glue. <laughs> um, it, it is the glue. Um, you know, it sustains us. Um, this faith that we have sustains us. It sustains our through our ancestors, through slavery, through Reconstruction, Jim Crow. I mean, up to this point in the 21st century. And it's and it has taught us to establish that community as Bishop Spencer has, has alluded to. Um, I think we lost that. Um, you know, it used to be, you know, I used to, have, growing up in uh, Morton, PA in Delaware County, we had a small community, but everybody knew everybody. And, it, and everybody knew um, maybe your business or what have you, but everybody knew each other's family. And I believe that sense of community um, is missing. And I believe in the context of this COVID-19 has brought us to the forefront that you are my neighbor, that I love you and I care about you. And, and um, you, for that we, um, in order to survive, I need you, just like Kurt Franklin would say. And we need to bring that sense of community together because if we don't have that community that sustained us as African-American families and, and it says um, that we need to bring it once again and even through this uh, COVID-19 has brought it through the forefront that my, my communities may look differently, but you're still my neighbor and I still care about you. 
And so it's important that whatever you need, you just can just call me or you could just stop by the um, stop by the church or whatever it may be, whatever it is that we need to continue to bring that that sense of community in the forefront. So that's my response to that question. Thank you. Now, um, Reverend Marshall. Yep, Sonia, faith, faith, faith is the secret sauce, right? That is, if I can get my kids who are straight A students at Abington Friends or at Springside Chestnut Hill Academy, if they're gonna, hand, they're gonna have beautiful lives, they're gonna wind up with magnificent jobs, they're gonna wind up with hundreds of thousands of dollars in scholarship. But when the rubber meets the road, if you don't have something that is both bendable and durable, you're gonna have a crash along the way. And I think that's across cultures and across religions. Um, it, it occurred to me as I was contemplating this morning, sitting thinking, so the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium founded by Dr. Ayla Stanford, who is a member of Salem Baptist Church, the very first time the consortium met, uh, when we were four people with a van with the idea that we should go into the city of Philadelphia and test black people for coronavirus, right? Such a, and that was just nine or 10 months ago. So it was in April, April the 16th. That started in a church parking lot in the pews. It's very much like the anti-slavery movement for both black and white Christians that it started in churches. Um, so while I'm thinking about this enormous task that Dr. Stanford has done to test from Pottstown to Philadelphia, and she's tested 30,000 people for coronavirus using her own money and church parking lots and pews and older people who come with $5 crumpled who are just grateful to God that she's doing what she's doing. That is happening because of her faith. Um, another young lady, my dad pastored a church in Philadelphia, Penn Memorial Baptist Church. I just got a notification yesterday that a young lady who grew up in our church, Ms. Michelle Morse, uh, Morse rather, Dr. Michelle Morse, who trained at Harvard, who has been at, uh, who has been uh, active in public policy. She was just named the health commissioner for New York City, right in the middle of a pandemic. This young black woman who's in her 30s, who is eminently qualified and trained, but still leaning on her faith. And I know most people here, because you all are Philadelphia Eagles fans, probably don't like Tom Brady, right? But every single time you get, you watch Tom Brady, irrespective of his politics, irrespective if you like the New England Patriots or not, everybody here has in the back of their mind, he's gonna win, he's gonna kill us, and we're not going to win, right? Because he brings some secret sauce. He took a team like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers that was a lackluster non-playoff team, and he brought something there. So he brings some secret sauce. You can't say it's deflate gate because, you know, you can't have all of that going. You can't say it's Bill Belichick because now he's won it without Belichick and the P Patriots went down. But he is bringing, Haley, he is bringing something of the secret sauce, and he absolutely brings it to everything he does. For me, faith is what people bring to the table. It is the secret sauce. So that when I don't have enough money, I'm still faithful and believe I can win. When I come from a racial group that might have been trammeled upon by the Constitution and even the founding fathers, and people are screaming 1776, and I say that's all well and good, but I'm not looking to 1776 unless I talk about Christmas acts. Because it, faith gives you this unbelievable intangible that gets you through the thickets and thorns of life and makes you the winner. And I think the more we can do that, the more we can emphasize that, the more we can make space for faith, even in the public sphere, without obviously uh, jeopardizing uh, the, the freedom to be free from religion and violating the Establishment Clause. But I think the more we can find ways to bring faith into the public context, the stronger we will be as a nation. Reverend Marshall, I agree and wholeheartedly hear what you're saying. But please don't assume that all of us are Eagles fans. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I appreciate all of the input. And uh, we're actually going to be moving on to our wrap-up questions. And in addition to our wrap-up questions, for any of the participants that would 
like to ask a question, please do so by placing your questions in the chat and to allow for appropriate time, we would like to have the closing remarks by our COO, Lee Soltesia. So please keep the time frame in mind. So dignitaries, I have a question that I'm going to throw out to all of you and it's going to be in no specific order. But one of the questions are, what systemic factors have affected the structure of the black family? If you could give, give me a response within two minutes, that would be appropriate. Who I've gone to too, I've gone too long, so I'll go first and be very short. I'll violate one of the basic tenets of being a black Baptist pastor by not using the full two minutes. Structural racism in housing, right? Which has a cascading economic implication for families. The most likely thing that people are, are to pass down in addition to their name will be family property. And as long as you have patterns of racism and discrimination, which are institutionalized in banking, right? And we, we see that even in banking with respect to Salem Baptist Church. Salem is 137 years old. And every single time we go to a bank, we've got to prove that we've actually been in business for more than two weeks. And so as, until America can really uh, can, can, can get this bile out of its system and this bias out of its system, America is still going to be talking about a more perfect union rather than a perfect union. So I think the sooner we look at and when we really eradicate the racism in housing and you see it even in appraisals, right? If you've got pictures of black people on the wall, the appraisers are coming in and in the same neighborhood, you're getting by $100,000 different appraisals, because we still as a nation can't get out of our way. And I think we've got to do that left and right. We've got to do it black and white. We've got to do it gay and straight. And we've got to be very, very forthright and honest about it, because it's going to ultimately make our public balance sheet stronger. Agreed. Who would like to go next? Well, I was trying to get the mute button off. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so I, you know, I'm a young man. And so and um, I look at things under you guys, and I appreciate everything that's being said. I think it's important um, that um, those who are above me that are educated, those who are above me that has been through uh, the sy system of life, we have to come together to educate those who are under you. Because um, I don't think we are all educated enough or know the information to fight against something that we don't understand. It's just like for many years uh, with black families, we're making young children make adult decisions. And so they grow up, they grow up with these deformities that they have to become something and, and look, view this and you can say it's wrong, but they don't understand. So it, we have to invest in educating. We have to invest in bringing these groups together, no matter who they are all over the neighborhood, so that you, so we all can fight better, you know? They, they say they call the old because they know the way they call the young because they're strong, and we still have our ears open. Now, from the hood to the, to, to the great neighborhoods, we still have our, our ears open. See, I, I live in Delaware. I live in the hood. Amen, somebody. And what I do as a young man that lives in the hood, as a pastor, I can walk down the street with all my dudes on the corner, white, black, Mexicans, and say, hey, they say, hey, this is the preacher. I say, I want to educate you on something a few, for a few minutes. Now, you're going to be standing on my corner, but you devalue my corner by you standing here and you can't sweep. The simple things, you, 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 your trash is on the ground. So what I'm expecting you to do is do something different while you're on my corner. So now I can take my little uh, tap, my little uh, little laptop right now and walk down the street and you'll see these guys are sweeping because I'm educating them. And, then, and so this level of conversation has to be so simplistic that we can give to our neighborhoods so that they will know how to fight this fight that's visible but invisible for their understanding. Thank you. And as for me, um, I, I believe it's the inequities of a good quality education. 
Um, as an education, as as an educator, I'm in work in higher education, and um, I have student taught um, in school districts. Um, and there's still an educational funding racial racial bias throughout the state of Pennsylvania, throughout this country, uh, when how how we use uh, utilize funding for our school districts. Um, I'm in a school district that has lost in Potsdam School District has lost. $13 million based on uh, the, the a fair um, funding formula that we should be getting more. Um, I'm, um, I have a, I'm sure with our superintendent has to cut um, a lot of teachers. We don't have the resources that like we should have um, and to have um, the technology that we should have and I believe it's very important. It does affect the uh, the black family when you don't when we're resulted in um, virtual schools, whether to be in school or in virtual schools, and the 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 families don't have the internet equipment. Um, the fam the um, parents are now working at home, and the fam and the and the children are now at home. Um, it's been a difficult time for families that I know. Um, that, but I believe if we put our resources together and think educationally, um, that we can make it work. And it starts here in, in Pennsylvania that we could bring and filter down money towards our, and make it fair for every, um, public school system. Um, so I, I, I want to see that, um, yeah, I, I still want to see that our school districts are with our black and brown students are receiving the resources like our, our white counterparts. Um, I want to see that. And I, I, so I believe that if we think educationally, we think invest our time in our young people, invest our, our resources in our young people, it will make um, a better family and a better community for, for generations to come. Thank you. So our next question is, what gives you hope about the future of the Black family? And again, this is open to all of the panelists. Uh, I, I don't know. So uh, what, get, what gives me hope, there was a backup question that you put up there. It says, how have faith leaders been supporting the mental health needs of, of families during the pandemic. Um, um, this pandemic gave me hope, reason because we start acknowledging there is a mental health issue all over in the church, in our communities. And it is starting to allow us to really take accountability of what's going on, number one, in our households and then in our families. So now we can address things that we have been ignored. So, because sometimes we busy for no reason. And when sometimes if we don't get stopped, we'll allow stuff to be swept under the rug and the rug would develop a heel. And when the rug is developing a heel, there's nothing you can do about it but start exposing what's going on. So this pandemic um, gave me hope because a lot of families that I know starting to find out what's going on in their internal family. But even my family, I got a 20 year old son, I got an 18 year old daughter. I, I'm starting to sit down and see how they view the world. And if, is there any hope for you, you know? And their response gives me hope. So um, again, my, my big thing is educating, finding out the truth and moving forward from there. Thank you. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful because I see measurable gains in educational attainment and economic progress for black women. It is a group that unsupported, underappreciated with all of the things loaded on them and they're still soaring. And so as the mother goes, so goes the family. As the women go, so goes the church. As the women go, so ultimately go the school. And so the woman as foundation for the success of the community, you know, I, I worked on this, I straddle between the church world and I work in film. So if you've ever seen a movie, Hidden Figures, 
that was a film that I helped. I produced the, the marketing campaign for that, all of its digital assets and uh, finalized the screenplay. And so here you are in the 19, early 1960s with these black women who are mathematicians and they are figuring out a way to make sure our astronauts fall into a specific bucket in the ocean so that they are safe upon re-entry, right? So they're doing rocket science in the 1960s. When you watch Perseverance and that new Martian Land Rover, young black women are figuring out ways so that with math, that lander can, can, can land with precision. And so when you're seeing that, and now that wasn't just an anomaly when you talk about Katherine Johnson in 1960s, the same thing is happening in 2021. And so what does that mean? That means we've got a pattern. So here's what I've done. Here's what I think we can do. Here's what I think churches can do. Here's what Montgomery County can do. Here's what Ken Lawrence and Val Arkush and Joe Gale can do, is they can open up the resources, the enormous resources in science, healthcare, engineering, mathematics, and we can help to make Montgomery County this yeasty, remarkable community where schools, after school programs, campuses, sanctuaries, fellowship halls, synagogues, and mosques are all conspiring for the success of people. And until we get on that same page, we're still not going to be as hopeful as we should be. And so I think working together in a spirit of comity, C-O-M-I-T-Y, is going to help us to get to where we need to be. But we've got to be intentional about it. And February isn't enough time to do it, right? And so I think that's what we've got to do. We've got to do it across racial lines. We've got to do it across religious lines. We've got to do it across uh, the lines of the public and private sector. And we've got to get out of our own way to do it. I'll be even more hopeful then. Thank you. And as for me, um, as I look at the future of the, the black family, we're, you know, it's, we're resilient. Um, it's, it's in our DNA um, to the wilderness, the wildernesses that we, we go through that we're, that we're here together. We, we have seen it um, from time and time again. And, um, and when I look at it, that, you know, as far as the future of the of the black family, we're, you know, we we've been through so much, and we're 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 going somewhere um, for that. And if we just begin to understand our roles um, within the family, um, as you know, I know there's a lot of single parents, and there's a lot of those who are married and have children. Understand understand the roles. And if we understand the roles of, of the family um, and everyone plays a part in the family, we, we can um, do better and, and um, do better. Um, and, but I, I see the, the future of the black family and there's so much support there when it comes to the, the black church, um, the community, um, the future is bright. When I look at young people in activism, um, fighting um, the things that matter to, uh, to us. And um, I believe that we're, we're on the up and up uh, when it comes to that, when it comes to that activism and understand the pulse of our community. And if we understand the pulse of our community, then things are gonna be, be better, continue to be better for the black family um, for years and decades to come. Thank you all for your responses to the wrap up questions. We will now begin to answer questions from the chat. And again, for the panelists, this is open to you all. So one of our questions is, how can we desegre desegregate Sunday service or how can the church work together for what is just and right? It, you know, King, King was the one who very famously said the most segregated hour in America is Sunday morning during church, whether it's at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. And, and, and I think he is right, but worship services now are down to about 45 minutes to an hour and an hour and 15 minutes. 
and, and let's say they are segregated by race, denomination, worship style. We're a more traditional church. There might be a more charismatic worship and people might say, you know what, that's just not for me. I would be willing to say, if you're going to have a segregated Sunday morning for an hour and an hour and 15 minutes, then make sure the remaining six days, 23 hours and 15 minutes is very highly integrated. So one of the things that we do at Salem, and it works for us, I'm not suggesting it works for everybody else, is we have a food cupboard at Living Word Lutheran Church, which is a church in Roslyn that, that we have purchased. The entire thrust of our purchase of that church was to feed people and to build a senior citizen center. That's it, right? It, it's not creedal. I, you know, I can dress it up and put some mystery of religion all around it just if I have to satisfy very religious people. But the entire thrust is to feed people. And Jewish bellies grown the same way Methodist bellies grown. And so if you've got this segregated hour at nine or 10 or 11, God bless you. It's not ideal. But for God's sake, the remaining six days, 23 hours and 15 minutes, integrate the heck out of what you do and feed atheists, feed Baptists, feed Jews, feed Muslims and keep going. And if you do that well, you will find that you have so much in common during the six hours, 23 six days, 23 hours and 15 minutes, that that will flow into your worship because you will find so many blessings from people who are going to find comfort in what you do. And it becomes a lot easier to share at that small sacred kernel hour. So if you start and develop the habit of letting people, I don't care if somebody's willing, if they're an atheist, then they want to volunteer at the food cupboard. Who cares what religion somebody is, right? Let's be more and increasingly practical about our religion. And the more practical we are with God, the more practical God will be with us. That's just what I believe. Thank you, Reverend Marshall. Bishop Spencer, do you have anything to add? So you can you repeat that question again? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that question? Sure. If the question was, hold on, let me scroll back through the chat. Um, it was in terms of desegregation in the churches and what are we going to do about it? So, so I was in, I was in totally agreement with um, Reverend Marshall because um, we as pastors or leaders has to be more visible to our communities. We Sometimes we're so stuck in the four walls that they don't really get to know us at all. Uh, sometimes we don't even walk down the block and say, this is what we offer and, and embrace our um, brothering. I mean, embrace our brothering of all different faiths. Faith. So we have to become what we say we are. We are community-based leaders. So we have to get involved with this community, fit our hands to the ground, our feet to the ground to get this thing forward. Because my church as well, we feed almost every day in Norristown, um, especially uh Tuesdays and Thursdays, and also be partnering with other um, safe house communities just to get things done. So we got to be about the work. We can't be about the offering. Uh, if we gonna, we can't um, get used to counseling the same people, there are more people that need our reach so that things get better. And if we start doing more being visible, we'll see a definite change. Because some, sometimes on your block, some people don't even know who you are. All they see is cars pulling up. And you may feed, they don't even know until we extend the hand and, and say that we got counseling. You, we got people that, I was so ashamed. Can I just say that I was so ashamed that I had uh, a family member of one of the victims of one of the young ladies, young little girl that passed away because of something happened between our family. I didn't know. I was having service and they, the family was going around the corner with balloons and I had to stop the service. I stopped the service. And I said, I am so sorry that I did not know this was going on in my community. I had to apologize because my responsibility as a pastor is to know what's going on on my block or around the corner. So we got to be more visible for these things to happen. Thank you, Bishop Spencer. So what I'll do now is for time of being on schedule and on track, I will address Reverend Lockley with this question that we have from the group chat. 
What is your church doing to help the neighborhood that you live in? Uh, at Bethel Amy Church in Pottstown, we are um, continue to collaborate. We, we are a church that collaborates with various churches in our community, and we are um, addressing the food scarcity through, through this pandemic. So we're um, open up our hearts, open up our pockets when it comes to um, with food items, um, uh, with boxes um, of food. Uh, when it comes to the milk and the cheese and the and and bread, whatever our community needs, we want to continue to be there as far as um, uh, food related. Um, we also continue to um, continue to give out gift cards to um, to our community. We just never. It might be some random person we just open up our hearts with various gift cards whatever they need um when it comes to our church and um we are helping out um our homeless um population um because there is a systemic uh poverty in um in our country that we need to address it's not the poor people it is the problem it's the systemic poverty system that is is the problem and it's important that we um, continue to address the needs of our um, our population, whatever um, walks of life that they come from. And we are um, opening up our hearts. We have a wonderful community center um, uh, that opens up for our homeless. We are donating leaps and bounds as far as um, uh, clothing from uh, toiletries, whatever it may be. Because if we can lift people up out of their poverty, it, le it, it gives them encouragement and hope. So we're definitely addressing the needs of our, our community um, at this time. I'm looking forward to even through this virtual uh, space that we're in, we're trying to, we're going to eventually create a uh, tutoring, a virtual tutoring program. Um, so students and their parents can um, come to us and that we'll provide tutoring for them virtually. They're, they're already um, working with us. So we're in the works of that. I'm excited in this season of this, uh, that we wanna be practical theologians. We practice what we preach and we continue to um, be that vessel to our community um, that needs us because we are the church. Thank you, Reverend Lockley. So at this time, we do have a few questions left in the chat that won't get uh, asked today, unfortunately, due to the time crunch that we have. Um, so dignitaries, I'm not sure if you're comfortable or if you would like to leave your um, contact information in the chat so that members could reach out to you um, offline uh, for the additional questions that we have not asked. That would be greatly appreciated. In addition, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize or acknowledge all of the other dignitaries that are on the call, on the call, as well as the clergy. So thank you for attending. So at this time, we are going to get ready to conclude the program. And from the Black History Committee, we would like to thank our commissioners. I see Commissioner Ken Lawrence is on. Uh, we would like to thank our row officers. I know that Sheriff Phil Kenny is on and Treasurer, I saw J Jason Salas on as well. I hope I didn't miss anyone else. Uh, in addition to that, Lee Saltesiak will be speaking and he will conclude the service as our COO. Uh, Barbara O'Malley, who was on, I believe the second week as well, who is our Chief Operations Officer. We would like to thank our panelists. We would like to thank our participants and a special clap to the committee members who sacrificed their lunch breaks, who took time to coordinate all, this, all of these sessions. Um, it's been fun working with everyone. Uh, in addition to that, um, we look forward to seeing everyone 2022. And we hope that we have satisfied everyone's expectations with the education and the knowledge that we have provided. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to the COO, Lee Saltesiak, for his closing remarks. 
Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, and thank you for inviting me back again uh, this year. I, I want to start, I really just have a, a short list here of thank yous. Uh, and I want to start with the, uh, the committee. And just like everything else uh, this year, you know, this, this whole event had to be completely rethought and reinvented. And it would have been certainly easy and if not even expected that this event didn't happen uh, this year, but instead you all made it bigger, you made it longer, you've increased the participation, not just from the county, but also uh, the community. And, you know, that that's just an incredible uh, and I'd say unexpected, but actually not too unexpected with this group um, uh, turn of events here over the past 12 months. And I know, and I'm well aware of the fact that when you all were working on putting this program together um, and lining up speakers and putting uh, all of the details in place that nobody was tending to your inboxes. Nobody was returning your phone calls and you all obviously had to continue uh, doing that uh, as well. So I appreciate it. And it, it really is truly an honor to be working with all of you. Uh, to the leaders in the faith community, uh, particularly the ones who joined us today, thank you. Uh, your work over the last year across Montgomery County and in the region uh, has been invaluable. You know, COVID, as has been discussed a lot here today, you know, it has exposed so many difficult issues about uh, our society. And, you know, it has brought such a great sense of loss on so many different levels. And you have been there for the community and your members uh, and the county when we all needed you most. Um, the uh, Reverend uh, Marshall lost me a bit, uh, I'm sorry, Mitchell lost me a bit when uh, during his sermon about Tom Brady there, but he pulled me back in uh, when we got to talking about the public balance sheet. That, that really did stick with me. I, I, and I think that's right, you know, looking at the entire picture of what makes up our community and our systems and understanding what they all add up to. Uh, and I think the, uh, the image here of the public balance sheet is something that will stick with me. And uh, if you don't mind, I will, I will lift and probably repeat. Uh, the faith community, you know, along those lines, you, know, you all led early on in finding new and safe ways to continue to do what you do uh, and now you have transitioned into uh, converting that trust you built with how you have handled the pandemic uh, in the community as we begin to deliver vaccines when trust is so important in our ability to do that. So uh, a sincere thank you uh, from all of us. Two more groups to thank here. I'm going to start with uh, the county employees who were uh, listening in today. Thank you. You know, thank you for choosing public service. Thank you for choosing Montgomery County. And thank you in particular what, for what you have done over the past uh, year to help each other, to help our community, and to keep the, the vital government services that we provide to our community uh, you know, ongoing without skipping a beat over the past 12 months. You know, I know you did that from your kitchen tables, your cars, your makeshift classrooms, and your living rooms. Um, and uh, that it work is truly appreciated by everyone. The work we do here has never been more important, you know, really to every single county uh, resident. And it has reminded us all that public service matters. You know, the government service matters. And that competent and compassionate and persistent county employees really do matter. In a year that revealed and really proved that in a crisis, the most vulnerable people in our society are too often the first hit and the hardest hit and the last to be helped. I hope we all feel motivated and empowered to, enter, to, to shine really the brightest light on these issues and to do our collective parts to change them. Now, I think we should ask ourselves the hard questions and the uncomfortable questions you know, when I, as COO, I am, there are a couple, a lot of things I'm worried about, two in particular. It's the problems I don't know about 
and it's the good ideas I might not ever hear about. After 2020, I feel like <laughs> we've all had our fair share of the problems we uh, that are lurking out there. And so I'll set that aside for now and just spend a minute focusing on the ideas and making sure that as COO, I hear about them, that the commissioners hear about them, and hopefully that our constituents ultimately benefit from them. We all need to seize this moment and view our own actions and our policies and the services we deliver through the lens of the long overdue level of social awareness that we have right now. And to borrow a line, I do think we need to view this opportunity with the fierce urgency of now. I wanna do it together and I hope, I sincerely mean this, I hope you all continue to feel as empowered as I do to help make the change we all want to see here in our community. As we reflect on the history made by so many great Americans this month, I hope you all will wake up each day believing and understanding that you can make the kind of change today as a county employee that people will be talking about at this event 50 years from now. And I look forward to doing that with each and every one of you. To the community, to close here, because I know not everyone is on the payroll that is watching today, you know, I hope you will hold us to the high standards we have set for ourselves. You know, I understand that people sometimes set a low bar for government, so we want to make sure we do more than just clear it. And to call on the theme for this week, I hope you will have faith in us, but continue to hold us accountable. We want and we need your help and your input and your ideas. So thank you for supporting these events this entire month. And I do look forward sincerely to seeing you all in person very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We look forward to seeing you next year and hopefully we will exceed our expectations. <laughs>